few years ago, a um, number of years ago actually, you know, I became friends with a man who's an attorney, and he told me that uh, he'd studied constitutional law when he was at law school. And I just finished reading the Federalist Papers. I don't know if you've ever uh, read those of the writings of Alexander Hamilton and uh, James Madison and John Jay, um, arguing for, the, for a strong central government against the anti-federalists and um, their vision of the government was eventually adopted. And uh, so I'd read those and I'd read in some detail the Constitution. So I began to pepper him with questions. And at some point he said, um, look, he said, I, I think you've got me at a disadvantage. I've never read the Federalist Papers and I've only read in detail sections of the Constitution. I was surprised. And I said to him, well, what did you read when you were in law school? And he said, cases, legal precedent, decisions that were made by the courts. And, and so rather than read those primary documents, what was read was decisions made on the basis of those primary documents, or sometimes decisions on decisions on those primary documents, or decisions on decisions on decisions of those primary documents. At the Corinthian church, we've been reading through the book of 1 Corinthians, the, the, the Corinthian church had split itself into factions um, over the specific perspectives of, if you remember when he said Paul and Apollos and Cephas, which is another name for Peter. And, and they were arguing over uh, whom they should follow, which of these they should follow. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 6, uh, Paul talks about this through four chapters, and we only looked at the first two of them. But, but he sums this up, and uh, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 6, it's our text for today that we're going to be recoursing to, now, brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you'll not take pride in one man over and against another. Let's pray. Now, Father, help us you call us to draw conclusions about what you've told us in your word. But help us to not go beyond those things. And Lord, as we uh, consider our heritage today as uh, Christians who, whose spiritual forebears were the reformers, that we would be renewed in uh, our sense of importance and commitment to what is written to the Word of God. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. If the book of Hebrews was written by Apollos, which Martin Luther contended it was, then it's very interesting that the three people that Paul mentions around whom there were divisions in the Corinthian church uh, all have literature in the New Testament. And we've got the book of Hebrews. If Luther was right by Apollos, we've got two letters by the Apostle Peter. And uh, most of the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul. And you could take perhaps the letters of uh, Romans and Galatians as indicative of Paul's theology. And if you read those three uh, categories of literature, they're all very different. They have very different perspectives, but they're undivided in their witness to Christ. There are differences, but there aren't divisions. And Paul indicates to the Corinthians that the reason for that is that they all have the same authoritative source. The scriptures of what we would now call the Old Testament, the what is written that Paul refers to. And so they all have different insights, but not divisions. 
And Paul calls on them to focus their attention primarily on what is written and whatever oral teaching they have for them to listen to that teaching through the lens of what is written. Throughout the Middle Ages, the church had gotten away from that principle. The Bible had become essentially lost to tradition, to an interpretations of it and then interpretations of the interpretations and interpretations of the interpretations of the interpretations and canon law based on the scripture but then canon law based on canon law based on canon law and the reformation of the church in the 16th century happened because of this concept of ad fontes the Latin phrase simply means to the sources. To go back to the text, to the books of the scripture, the word of God, where God reveals himself, discloses himself, declares his will to his church. And up to that point, the Bible was revered, it was uh, held to be holy and sacred, it just wasn't read. And it was in reading those sources that the Reformation was born. And three religious myths were brought to light and corrected. Those myths are that sin, the definition of sin, is doing bad things. Um, that for God to accept me, I must pay for my sins or make up for my sins in some way. And the third is that justification rests upon sanctification. Now those are theological words, so we'll unpack those when we get to them. But the first myth is that sin is doing bad things. Now to say that sin is doing bad things has some truth to it, but it's not the whole picture. It's certainly a sin to lie or to cheat or to steal or to bear false witness. But all of those things are symptoms and manifestations of sin because sin is really deeper than that. The essence of sin is found in declaring our independence from God. In, in trying to find life and blessing on our own. In trying to find life and blessing apart from God. In seeking goodness apart from dependence on God. Let me show you. Um, God designated the first human beings that he created as representatives for humanity. And it's because they sinned that we have sinned, that the world is in the state that it's in today. Um, and you only need to turn on the news to see the state that the world's in today. And so the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 5 that it was because of uh, the, the sin of the first people that sin entered into the world. So what was this terrible sin that's kind of ruined uh, everything for us, messed everything up. I think most people today would uh, agree that things seem kind of messed up. We read back in Genesis chapter uh, 2, the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for in the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. And then in chapter 3, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. 
and you say, that's it? That was the sin that, that threw us into the situation that we find ourselves in today? They ate fruit they weren't supposed to eat? I, I mean, I was expecting something much worse. Right? But the essence here is in their declaration that I'm independent of God. See, if you go back to Genesis 1, you see that God created human beings in his image. And you get this idea that being created in the image of God um, was kind of like, you know, like an acorn, right? Like an acorn like has the whole oak tree in it, but it's got to grow into the oak tree. And, and we were created in the image of God. That's what we were. It was all there. But it was to find expression. And what happens is that the tempter comes along and he says, you can find the fullness of what God's created you for, but you don't need God. And you don't have to do it God's way. And, and that's the essence of sin. You need to understand that to understand why the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, in Mark uh, chapter 10, there's a story uh, about a man who came up to Jesus as he fell on his knees and he said to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, don't defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I've kept since I was a boy. I, I love Mark's account of this because Mark tells us Jesus looked at him and loved him. He loved him enough to tell him the truth. And he said, well, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. At this point, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. It's an interesting thing. Um, I think that if most people looked at this fellow's life, they would have said, here's a, here's a good guy. Right? Doesn't lie, keeps himself pure, doesn't commit adultery. And, and Jesus says to him, essentially, that's good. Good. D do you trust me? If you do, then get rid of everything you have and come follow me. And that really exposes the issue here that, that, I'm, that I'm willing to inherit the kingdom. I want to inherit the kingdom if I can do it on my own terms. And this condition of declaring our independence from God, don't get me wrong, can lead to some pretty bad behaviors. But, but the behaviors, the sins, are the result of the condition of independence from God. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 19 and following, uh, we're told that what may be known about God is evident to us because God's made it evident to us. Because ever since the creation of the world, God's uh, eternal attributes, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen so that we're without excuse. And what's the problem? Well, Paul goes on to say that we didn't see fit to retain God in our thinking. We wanted our independence. And Paul goes on from there. If you read from uh, verse 29 through 31, the result of that it results in shameful lust and every kind of wickedness and depravity and greed and evil, all the things that you see when you turn the news on. Because the church had gotten away from the Bible, it thought that sin was essentially to be found in doing bad things. And so there were clearly sinners because there were clearly people who did bad things, but there were also saints. But because they weren't reading the Bible anymore, they didn't use that word the way the Bible uses. it. See, saints were people who were so good that they didn't have sin. If they ever did have sin in the past, they were so good now that their lives made up for it. And they completely missed that 
Paul had said in Galatians 2.21, if righteousness could come through the law, could come from my complying with the law and doing good things, Christ died needlessly. And, and so the Bible looks at all people, those people that we would say that guy's a pretty rotten guy, and those people that we look at and say that, that guy's a pretty good guy. And it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't mean that all people have done terrible things, although everyone's conscience tells them that they've done things that they're not proud of. Doesn't your conscience tell you that? Mine does. But it does mean that all people have declared independence from God. And our propensity is to seek to live life on our own terms. You know, it's interesting as you read through the Bible that you find is that terrible people often recognize their sins. Whereas the good people sometimes can't, which is why I think that most of the people who follow Jesus were prostitutes and swindlers and those who cheated people and took bribes. There were a few good people. There were some Pharisees and some Sadducees and some scribes. But there were few. Going back to the source, the Bible shows us what sin really is. Sin isn't merely doing bad things. Sin is seeking to live independently of God. Now, the sources also exposed another myth, and that is, for God to accept me, I have to pay for or make up for my sins. That idea makes sense to us, right? If I broke it, I'm responsible to fix it. And that misconception became the cornerstone of the medieval church. As I already said, that there were, there were saints, right, whose lives were so exemplary that they made up for any sin that they might have had at any time. And then there was this concept of purgatory, where people would go to pay for their sins for a time before they could get into heaven. And you recognize in that uh, name, purgatory, right, the word purge. It means to be purged of your sins. The problem is that purgatory is not in the Bible. And saints do not refer to people who never sin and whose lives are so good that they make up for uh, any sin that they might have had. If sin is found primarily in being independent from God, who's the source of all blessing, how do you make up for that? You can't do it by being good. Um, there's no statute of limitation on sin, right? If, if, you, if you commit a crime, I'm bringing this into, you, you know, kind of the human realm here, but if you commit uh, a crime, uh, an egregious crime, let's say like murder, and you did that 40 years ago, it really doesn't matter how good you've been since then. It doesn't make up for it. And the reason for that, what the reformers found is they read the Bible and got a sense for it, is that God is holy beyond what we imagine. And any sin separates us from him forever. This idea that we can be good enough is, is prevalent in religion, what I'll call religion, the, the man-made attempt to figure out some system to reconcile us to God. By the way, why are there religions the world over? Because we all recognize that something is wrong, something's dreadfully wrong, and that that something that's wrong has to do with our separation from God. But that contrast to the good news the gospel that God sent his son into the world to do for us what we were unable to do for ourselves. And so in Romans 3, we read, no one is righteous, not even one. 
All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in the Old Testament, in dealing with sin, God didn't command his people, do better, be better people. Well, he did. He called them to repentance. But that's not how they were to atone for their sin. They were to atone for their sin by bringing sacrifices of, an, of atonement. But those sacrifices were a picture. They didn't themselves take away sin. Apollos tells us that in Hebrews 10. I'm going to assume Luther was right here. And listen to what he says. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. With impeccable logic, he asks the question, if it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshiper would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have had guilt for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And so what will? Well, our writer continues, we've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What can atone for our sins? What can make us acceptable to God? Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he said, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the Apostle Peter wrote the same thing. See, their, their testimony is all of one. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order to bring us to God. I can't pay for or make up for my sins. Not by my good works, not by any religious observance. But Christ paid for my sins, bridging the gulf that existed between me and God. And going back to the sources, the reformers rediscovered that, that sin is really to be found in our seeking to be independent from God. They rediscovered what God did, not what we have to do, but what God did to solve that. That God sent his son to die the death my separation from God deserved. And so Paul said in Romans 6.23, the, the wages of sin, that wages are what you're paid, what you're owed. The wages of my seeking independence from God is death. But the gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Well, the third and the last myth is that justification rests on sanctification. Now, those aren't words that you really hear outside the church and theology, justification and sanctification. Um, sanctification has to do with holiness, and I suppose that needs to be defined too, because I think for a lot of people, if you ask somebody what it meant to be uh, holy, you might think of somebody in a robe or somebody with their uh, hands folded or somebody uh, who engages in certain kind of religious observances. But remember I told you that we were created in the image of God to be like God. To be holy simply means to be like God. To, to be holy means to look like Jesus, to walk as Jesus walked. And that's what sanctification is. But justification has to do with our acceptance with God. Why are we accepted by God? The medieval church taught God loves you and accepts you to the degree that you do good. God loves you and accepts you to the degree 
that you do good. Your justification, your acceptance with God rests upon your sanctification. And it makes sense that they would think that. That's how most of life is, right? Your boss loves you. Why does your boss love you? Because you do a good job, right? In much of life, your acceptance is based on your performance. But when those who led the Reformation went back to the sources, they discovered something amazing. Justification does not rest on sanctification. In fact, it's quite the other way around. We're not justified by our works, our goodness, or our performance, but we're justified by faith. That means by trusting in God and what he's done. And listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 3.23. For we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And to the Galatians, he wrote, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. And so what they saw as they read the scriptures is that God justifies people by faith in Jesus and on the basis of that acceptance, calls them for their lives to change, calls upon them for their lives to change. It's not that he calls people to do good, and to the degree that they do good, then he accepts them. And the reason for that is simply this. You know, the Apostle John, in his gospel, wrote that Christ came into the world. He said he came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, who had faith, he gave the right to become the children of God. You know, God is Lord, and God has always been Lord. And Jesus affirms that, but Jesus came into the world to tell us something that you didn't find, we're, we're used to this with our culture that has been Christianized, but it was almost scandalous that Jesus said that because of what he was doing, you could call God Father. Father. You know, when my own son was four years old, I had an opportunity I remember um, thinking this is a golden opportunity to teach him this truth. Uh, he'd done something wrong. He was disciplined for it. And afterwards, because, and let me encourage our young families that when you have to discipline your children, that always should end with acceptance and love and not distance. And, and afterwards, when all the tears were passed, I had him um, on my lap, and I looked right in his eyes, and I said to him, does Daddy love you when you do bad things? And I remember putting his eyes down, he said, no. And I said, no, son. Daddy always loves you. He will never stop loving you. I love you because I am your father. I love you because you are my son. Now, because you are my son, you will do the right thing. You will live up to my standards. But whatever you do, I will love you. That comes first. In other words, what I sought to teach him in my relationship with him, I hope it was reflective of a relationship with God, that his justification, his acceptance by me, 
was the basis of his sanctification, of his performance. It wasn't that how he performed was the basis of his acceptance with me. Those are the truths that our spiritual forebears rediscovered. Sin is not merely doing bad things. In essence, it's declaring our independence from God, refusing to retain God in our thinking, living like he's not there or that he doesn't matter. That's why it can say all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They rediscover that we can't atone for our sins, can't make up for our sins, can't pay for our sins. But what we could not do, God did once for all by sending his son to bring us back to God. And thirdly, God accepts us not because of how good we are, but by faith in his son who sent him into the world to reconcile us to himself. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a legal scholar. I readily admit that there are things about the law that I don't know. And, uh, and, I, and I gladly defer to people who have uh, expertise in that field or any field that I don't have expertise in. But I've got to tell you that sometimes I'm puzzled by the decision of our courts sometimes. And, and I wonder if it might not be because, because the experience of some of those judges is the same experience of my lawyer friend. They haven't read foundational documents. They've read decisions of decisions of decisions of decisions of foundational documents and, and have relied on legal precedent and tradition. That's what happened to the church in the Middle Ages. I uh, grew up in a family that was a part of the old church and, 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 and had retained, a fear still does, retained a lot of those notions. When I was a young man, I became interested by God's grace in spiritual things, a young adult. I went back to church. I was constantly plagued with the question, will God accept me? How would I know? How good is good enough? And it, it bothered me, you know, so much. I was plagued by this. I went to see my priest, and I, and I, and I spilled my guts, disclosed my heart to him, and I said, Father, I said, how, how good is good enough? You know what he told me? He said, well, he goes, nobody really knows the answer to that. He said, you've just got to do the, the very best that you can and hope that when the day comes that you stand before God that that was good enough. I got to tell you, I left that meeting depressed. I didn't find comfort in that at all. I was filled with anxiety. But I had friends who gave me a Bible and sent me ad fontes to the sources. And there I found an answer to my question. How can I have acceptance with God? How good is good enough? And you know the answer that I found? Jesus is good enough. That is not an answer that I would have ever come to out of my own head. It's not an answer that anyone would have ever come to out of their own heads. But it's the answer we find at the source. Would you pray with me? Our Father, thank you for giving us your word. Lord, I think back to uh, the temptation of the woman and the tempter saying, did God really say? Uh, 
And she had no way of verifying that but her memory or what uh, she'd been told by her husband. We have your word made sure to us in the writings of the scripture. Lord, it's the source. Through it, we can know you. And help us to know you. And to find our hope and confidence in Christ. Amen. Amen.